speaker here. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. But he comes to us from Washington, uh, I've called the entertainment capital of the world. He leaves Washington, which someone defined as 10 square miles surrounded by reality. He brings us that reality. I said that I was so pleased to see him uh, as he left yesterday to fly to foggy Chicago. The airlines kept him and his beloved Mary on the airplane for over three hours. An illustrative of their humanness, when the two of them got off the airplane here in Chicago, both could have been fuming, but on the contrary, they both were their own smiling, gracious selves. Our guest taught law, he's right at home here, for 26 years at McGeorge Law School. He decided and determined and applied the law, having practiced it as a sole practitioner uh, for 12 years as a judge of the Ninth Circuit. And today, this very day, he starts his fifth year at the pinnacle of the American judicial system. We are so pleased and proud to have not only a scholar of the law, a teacher of constitutional law, but, and a member of the Supreme Court, the 104th American serving in that role, but to have with us a really warm and wonderful human being. Ladies and gentlemen, the 104th Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable Anthony M. Kennedy. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm, um, I'm really not used to being tied down to microphones, but I understand that uh, you're putting this on tape or something like that. I was reading a trial transcript not long ago. It came from a state court, and it was an arraignment proceeding. And you could tell from some of the comment that this criminal defendant at his first arraignment appearance had on some outrageous costume. And he kept saying, the Lord is my attorney, the Lord is my attorney. And the judge went through reading him all of his rights. And finally, the judge said, now I'm going to appoint an attorney to represent you. He said, oh, the Lord is my attorney. And the judge said, I, I know that we're going to appoint you local counsel. <laughs> so I see all the faculty and the trustees up here, so you can be my local counsel. Uh, the, the dean mentioned that... Uh, I've been on the court now for five years. It, it doesn't seem that long. I, I had a, a have a good friend who's a judge on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and his career was somewhat like mine in that he went to the Court of Appeals directly from private practice. He hadn't been a district court judge. And he tells a story. He was on the bench about six months, and counsel was arguing before the three-judge appellate panel. The submission was that the trial court had made a mistake in granting summary judgment. There was a trial, a tribal issue of fact, according to the attorney, and they wanted a reversal. So the attorney was just about through his oral argument. And he said, and it may interest the panel to know that this was a new district court judge. He'd only been on the bench three months. And my friend leaned over, he said, well, it may interest you to know, counsel, that uh, I'm a new judge. I've only been on the bench for six months. And without a moment's hesitation, the judge said, it's surprising, your honor, or the attorney said, it's surprising, Your Honor, how much a judge can learn in 90 days. <laughs> so, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much I've learned in five years, but uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, I'd be very pleased to entertain your, your questions. I, I see a few seats down here, unless you're trying to preserve your option for an early exit. Um, and there's a seat over here. I thought what I'd do is... Uh, I, I discuss anything with you you'd like. Maybe I'll spend a, a few minutes just telling you how the court works. And uh, 
then mention uh, just one or two substantive constitutional points and maybe make a few comments about law school or the profession, whatever seems to be on your mind this afternoon. As, as you know, we hear oral arguments in the court uh, from October through April. Uh, we hear generally 24 cases a month. And they're all difficult cases. Uh, we allow just an hour each. Uh, people ask me, what is the quality of the oral argument? I, I sometimes think we do a disservice to uh, the bar by complaining about the, uh, the poor arguments that we sometimes hear. Uh, with just a half hour per side, uh, the justices are keenly aware of the dynamic of that oral argument. Basically, uh, if, if you hear a, a, a question being asked by the justice to uh, the attorney, the, the purpose of that question is to start a dialogue with the justice's colleagues. It's a much more rich dynamic, a much deeper and more intricate process than just a two-way dialogue. And the junior justices on the court are quite anxious to ask the questions because they know they will be the last to talk at conference. And they want to make sure that their colleagues are aware of what they consider to be the sensitivities of the case. Uh, with 20 to 24 cases a month, uh, we have very little time uh, for debate and, and preparation and, and reflection. Uh, and so that hours oral argument is critical. That is when we're making up our minds. You know, sometimes people ask me, uh, does oral argument make a difference? And then they look back as it's a kind of a trick question, because if I say uh, yes, then I'm just being pushed around by some attorney. And if I say no, then I'm engaging in a charade. So they wait back and they, and, and they, and they look. Well, of course it makes a difference, and it should make a difference, because it's not just reverse or affirm. It's, it's, the, it's the theory that you propose, the theory the court adopts to decide the case. And there's, there, and, and there's nothing wrong with a system in which after a logical case built on the precedent has been made, you make a rhetorical case for its adoption. That's, that's the power and the passion and the beauty of the law. So if we see an oral argument that sometimes we think has one where the a, a attorney doesn't realize that we've taken his or her case uh, for systemic purposes, and the case hasn't been well thought out, we, we are somewhat disappointed. There's a, a lectern on the court. It is uh, uh, an antique, I don't know, mahogany or something, beautiful thing. And it has a crank on it so that it's adjustable for the height. And the attorney that's been there will always, before, or will always move the crank a little bit to show that he's not afraid of <laughs> this device. And we oblige him by asking him a good question uh, right, right away. I, I must say I've never wept at an oral argument. Um, in a conference which takes place 24 to 36 hours uh, after the oral arguments, we hear four cases a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Two cases in the morning, 10 to 12, two cases in the afternoon, one to three, hour off for lunch where on an argument day most of us have lunch together. Uh, so with uh, 12 cases in a week, uh, we have a tremendous amount of preparation and we have to go into conference and vote. The Chief Justice likes the vote to be relatively fixed uh, so that he can assign the opinions and so that uh, he can move the court. Um, but there's nothing required about that. The conferences are much more collegial and uh, there's a much freer and more beneficial exchange of views than is commonly supposed. Uh, Justice Scalia and I are particularly strong believers in this process. And justices will say that their views are tentative and they want to wait to hear the whole discussion. I uh, used to teach night law school. Uh, and my lecture was three and a half hours 
Uh, I competed with Monday Night Football for 26 years. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm used to, to uh, standing while I'm uh, to, to talking while I'm standing. I, I never have gotten the right voice control or eye contact with sitting down. And there was a case in my first term and where I was the junior justice to speak last, and I was pretty sure this case would be four to four before it got to me, which I liked because I always had the attention of my audience. And I thought, you know, I really do have the theory of this case, and it's going to take me five, maybe even ten minutes to explain. So I'm going to stand up like I used to in law school. I'll do a better job because I know I can maybe even convince some of the justices have voted the other way, and we won't even come out fighting for it. It'll be six three. Uh, sure enough, it was four to four. I, I had picked up Justice Brennan uh, on the way into the conference room. He used to like that. His office was down the hall from mine, and he knew that I was fascinated with the history of the court. And somehow, before we walked into the conference room, we got on the subject of Felix Frankfurter. He said, oh, yes, I, I remember Felix. He said, you know what he would do if there was a very important case? He would get up from his chair and stand and walk around the room. <laughs> and he said, that drove me nuts. <laughs> so I said, thank you. And I've kind of kept my seat ever since. <laughs> Uh, in the course of the opinion writing, of, uh, obviously there are many reasons for written opinions. Uh, not the least of which is a, it's a discipline on the thought of the writer. And there isn't a person in this room who hadn't sat down to write something, and the more they write, the worse it gets, and it's just plain wrong. And not a term goes by. But that this doesn't happen to one of us, each of us. And we go to the chief and say that, if he was the one that assigned the case, and say, Chief, I know you assigned me this case, uh, but it's just not working out. And the chief will be very disappointed, but he's gracious. And he'll say, well, go ahead and circulate what you've got and see if the court agrees with it. So that's, so that's the writing process that, that we go through. Uh, I won't break down statistically for you our, our jurisdiction. Uh, well, I can tell you, I guess, for reason, but there's about 30% criminal and capital cases. And then I would guess 45% special in, uh, industry or economic legislation, labor, railroads, banking, securities. Um, and matters of interest to the legal profession, evidence. Um, then another 10% administrative law, pure administrative law. That leaves just about 15% for constitutional cases. And of those, I think only maybe 10, 5 to 10% are matters of great public interest, school busing, women's rights, uh, abortion, free speech. And there will always be some of those high visibility issues during the term. And in resolving those, we, we should remember, I, I submit to my colleagues, um, that what we have with the Constitution, we, we, we have a Hamiltonian structure and a Jeffersonian Bill of Rights. And there's some tension there. And that's not bad. <laughs> the fact that the Constitution doesn't resolve anything, that the fact there is some tension, some play at the joints, is, is what makes it a, a document uh, that has been able to withstand the test of time. But the structural elements are ones that must not be forgotten. Uh, you know there, I think as a last count, uh, is your sound all right, Dean Markey? Is the, yeah. Well, it won't stay up. You see, I, I have a lifetime job and I'm fighting for survival with this cord. There has been, all right. Uh, remember that, oh, at last count, 
uh, and this was two years ago, so it must have changed since. I think there were 160 constitutions uh, in the world, not, not including our state constitutions, I mean for national governments. And some of them were more eloquent than ours. Uh, but they're not worth the paper they're written on. Because there's no structure that makes it survive. If I had time, I'd, I'd ask you what you think are the structural elements in the Constitution. And after we played around for a half an hour, you'd resolve on what I knew they were. And what they are is uh, separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism, and judicial review. Now, checks and balances and separation of powers, I think, are different. They work in uh, with opposing thrusts. The whole idea of separation of powers is to encourage the vigorous assertion of authority, the independence of the courts. But the whole idea of separation of powers is that the two branches or three work together. And this is just standard civic stuff, uh, executive veto, confirmation by the Senate of judicial appointments, etc. But remember that the essential feature of separation of powers, which is that there is a politically accountable branch of the government in the Congress, and a non-politically accountable, except in the most indirect sense, in the courts. And as lawyers, you must be very, very careful to understand that so far as the federal system is concerned, the Supreme Court of the United States must respect these constraints. Now, you know, every time you see a confirmation proceeding of a district court judge or a circuit court judge, and of course, Supreme Court justices, a senator will say, uh, now, if you're confirmed, uh, will you legislate? And say, oh, no, Judge or Senator, I won't legislate. I won't do that. Well, uh, you know, where do people think the law comes from? The stork? Uh, I mean, we made it all up. That's the, that's the beauty of the common law. Where do you think the law of contracts came from? Offer, acceptance, rejection. Damages, torts. Cardozo, the scope of the risk, and all that sort of thing. Judges made that all up. And they should. That's the genius of the common law. But that doesn't work with the Constitution. A constitutional judge in the Article Three system doesn't have the power and the authority of a common law judge. And it's amazing how many people don't understand that. And you see it in all different kinds of manifestations. The uh, Pressel report, uh, Congress enacts a statute to overrule Supreme Court decision. Well, that's poppycock. Congress is patching this, passing the statute because this old statute was broken, and we told them that. And it seems to me very, very dangerous for a court to take the position that it should kind of clean up what the legislature didn't do the right way. Because then you'll never have political accountability. Now, of course, Congress can, if it wants, I think, my position is, delegate that function to us, as it has done in the Sherman Act and the National Labor Relations Act. The Sherman Act, every combination in, in, in conspiracy and restraint of trade is unlawful. With one, two little lines, there are books written on it because the Congress has delegated that to us. But notice that if we're wrong, it's a statute and they can fix it. And that's the way it ought to be. But not with a constitutional decision. The Constitution has been amended really very few times. The first 10 were all in one swoop. And the next two were kind of housekeeping. And you have the three uh, great civil rights amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Uh, then more housekeeping. Then probation counts for two. Once they impose it, next they undo it. Women's rights, which came late, 100 years late at least. 
Um, it's tremendously difficult to amend the Constitution. And that's what you have to do when the court construes the Constitution. This is an awesome power. And you know, that this constitutional doctrine, the document that we, we had, that the framers didn't delegate some staff to write the thing up. And then they spent three months working on it. And there is a, the, the, the framers were um, men in those days, men of the Enlightenment. And they were fascinated with all kinds of clocks and balances and pendulums and gears and machines. And that's why there's this Newtonian aspect to the Constitution checks and balances. But they were also brilliant students of human behavior. And they knew, as Madison said, that men are not angels. They knew from wrong abuse the truth of the dictum that power corrupts. And the fundamental duty of the court is to protect this structure. Now, I could go on about federalism and, and judicial review, but I, I think you perhaps want to ask some questions. I'll, I'll just say a few things about judicial review. Um, there, there are two, it oversimplifies a little bit, but there, there are two theories for judicial review. One is that the judges just made it up in order to ensure that the system worked the right way. They had to make it up. And the other theory is that it's implicit in the design of the Constitution and was intended by the framers. Now, your theory of judicial review depends on the initial premise that you adopt. And again, if we'd have time, I'd, I'd ask you, under which of these two theories does the court have the more power? And though it's counterintuitive, I would suggest to you that the court has more power, more scope, more independent authority, more creative license, if you want to call it that, under the theory that the courts made it up. Because if they made it up from the beginning, they might as well make up the ground rules. I don't think the judges just made it up. I think it's implicit in the design of the Constitution. That's my reading of the Federalist Papers, beginning with about 78 and going through 81. And therefore, I believe the court has the sworn duty to protect this structure. Federalism, we could talk about a lot. Um, it, it's ironic that federalism is the one novel contribution that the framers made to the science of government. They really knew about separation of powers. They could see it in England. Monarchy. House of Lords, House of Commons. They didn't have quite the right explanation for it because they justified it in England as an Aristotelian mixed government so that you had power, monarchy, property, lords, numbers, commons. Well, that wouldn't work in the new American idea of freedom. So the framers had separation of powers, but they went in search of a reason for it. And the reasons were the one that I've given. Now, federalism was different. Federalism, the framers made up. And it's a brilliant but paradoxical theory that freedom is increased by having two governments instead of one. This, this, uh, this was a tremendous philosophic breakthrough. Sovereignty had always been thought of as an indissoluble core something indivisible. I once had to give a speech to some patent lawyers and engineers, and I thought, oh, what am I going to talk about? So I asked, I asked, is the Constitution a patentable invention? And I said what the framers did with federalism was they split the atom of sovereignty. 
And it was that much of a breakthrough to divide sovereignty between two governments. And it's something of an irony that the great contribution of the framers, federalism, has produced a system they would no longer recognize. And we don't necessarily need to bemoan that. That is just a fact. And you know the reasons for it. There are many. The Civil War, uh, the recalcitrance of southern states over civil rights, the fact that we have a national economy with a national consciousness, the fact that we have global military responsibilities, the fact that we think of ourselves as one nation. All these are reasons for the change in federalism. I don't know if you still study a lot of the Commerce Clause cases in constitutional law. Basically, what that is, is a battle over federalism to see if the court could find lines, and they couldn't. They just couldn't find adequate lines. Federalism still serves great purposes, somewhat different than the framers envisaged, I think. One is that it's a training ground for our new generation of leaders. In, in Japan, for 26 years, the people in the opposition government have never held a political position. This is very bad for the training of leaders under our federal system. You have a Governor Carter or a Governor Reagan who assembles a staff, who articulates his ideas, and becomes a president. And the party that's out of power can regroup in the states. This, the, this is a magnificent system. And it keeps us a, as a very healthy political society. So federalism serves these many purposes. Uh, these are some of the structural things uh, we, we consider. Um, the Jeffersonian Bill of Rights, of course, has a substantive element. I, I sometimes, I, I always wanted to have a brilliant constitutional law class consisting of people that had never read the Constitution. And I'd spend a week having them draw their own Constitution without having to peek at what we've already got. And I'd say, now, what, what, what do you think are the important rights in a Constitution? And if I told you that now, based on what you know, you'd say oh, jury trial, free speech, equal protection. A lot of you'd add maybe the rights of women should be explicitly protected. But then other people would say, uh, what about the right to minimum standard of health care? The right to enough food to eat? The right to shelter? You go to Washington, D.C. and see that man sleeping in the cardboard box on the steam grate, and you read him the Constitution. Now, he doesn't think he has a lot of freedom. He doesn't have enough to eat, and he doesn't have a place to sleep. And so you'd make an argument, this ought to be in the Constitution, because any decent society ought to take care of these minimum needs. I would question that that should be in a constitution as a judicially enforceable goal. And when European people that are East Europeans and others in Brazil and Pacific ask me about constitutions, I'd say, if you're going to have these goals, the American experience, you do what you want, but our experience is, they should be aspirational goals, not judicially enforceable. Reason? There are no judicial standards. The judiciary is just a super legislature. And interestingly enough, I see in many of the new constitutions which have these so-called affirmative rights, that it has the perverse effect that because it's in the constitution, the legislature thinks they don't have to address it. The, the, the judiciary does not solve every problem in this society, and it's a very weak society and a very politically effete one, which requires non-elected judges to solve its most basic social problem, and it's wrong in theory, and the framers never intended it. Now you'd say, well, but you know, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, particularly 14th Amendment, due process, equal protection, are written in spacious terms. It was an empty vessel for judges to pour things in. You can't just shove it off all in the legislature. And of course, there's the balance there. And it's a very difficult one. 
but those are some of the substantive issues that we, we address. Well, uh, now I've talked too long, which was always my habit in law school too. But um, with that kind of overall introduction, uh, but maybe maybe you have some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just uh, what would be your opinion about televising uh, oral arguments in the Supreme Court? Uh, the question is, what would my opinion be about televising oral arguments in the Supreme Court? Uh, my position is that I think it's a close question that so long as any of my colleagues object strongly, I will side with them. Um, we play to a packed house anyway. I don't think it would too much affect my colleagues. Uh, although Solicitor General Wade McCree said judges and attorneys are all like a casserole, there's a thin layer of ham. Um, I, you might tend to play to the cameras a little. We might be concerned with, what do they call it, the 30-second sound bite or something. I, I don't think so. We're too busy. We need the lawyer's help too much to play to the camera, but there's that fear. I, I do think that the idea of uh, an argument sh should not be interpreted the way the press likes to interpret it as a debate, a Lincoln-Douglas thing. A good oral argument can sometimes be like a quiet discussion of a doctoral thesis. And maybe that isn't all that ex exciting. I uh, do think there's a dignity and a decorum in our courtroom that I would not like to see destroyed uh, so that it plays for a national audience. On the other hand, I have to acknowledge, uh, let's see, it was the Chief Justice and Justice White and I sat up on the bench and some press people came in and showed us the new kind of cameras they have. You don't need special lights anymore. It's a very unobtrusive thing. You just don't notice it. And the press is part of the environment. You can't excise the press from the environment. They're there. They're part of it. We worry about oral arguments. Uh, suppose we could have a tape to show students, to, to, sh to show counsel that are coming to the oral argument. You can get audio tapes of the Supreme Court. I used to use them in my class. And the students would gather around this little tape recorder and listen. And, the, and the, the rule then was you couldn't get the tape unless the argument was five years old. Uh, so what I had, I, I used um, some great arguments. Um, uh, the uh, press privilege case, Brandsburg versus Hayes and New York Times versus Sullivan, both tremendous oral arguments, different styles of oral advocacy, and it was a tremendous teaching device. Uh, so I have to say there's a lot of merit to the argument of television in the courtroom. I tell you one selfish reason we do not want it, and that's for security. Now, nobody knows who we are, nobody cares, they're going to wander around. Um, on, uh, and, and if you know, if, if we're on for all the insomniacs at three in the morning on C-SPAN, uh, our, our life would just be, be miserable. Um, I was on a plane not long ago, and somebody said, now, now you're somebody, yeah, yes, you are the Solicitor General, Ken Starr. And I said, I, I said, that's funny. A lot of people think I look like Justice Kennedy. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> but that, that, that's a selfish reason. And, and maybe you say, look, at, look at, I take the job. I've got to pay the price. And that that's a stuff. But um, I have to tell you that's a factor. Uh, yes, sir. There was a, a question about uh, Presley versus Etowah County in which we interpreted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act to apply to voting and nothing more. Um, and, and the question is, well, and what happened in Presley versus Etowah County was uh, there's a, 
uh, a commission in Alabama called the Road Commission. And you don't get your streets fixed or your road fixed unless your commissioner on the Road Commission uh, is from your residency district and, and here's your plea. And in the first black commissioners in modern times were elected to these commissions. And when they were elected, then the commissions changed the rules. They said, well, we're going to change the way in which we allocate work. We're going to change budget control. And the allegation was, and we accepted this is, is, is true uh, for the purposes of the case, that uh, uh, this had the effect of diminishing the, the powers of, of, of the voting of, of the newly elected uh, uh, members. Uh, we found it very hard to say why this is any different from committee assignments in the state legislature. Uh, one, in one of these cases, what had happened was the road commissioners uh, had engaged in a series of corrupt activities for about 20 years, and so they changed it so that a county engineer would make all the decisions that were responsible to the road commission. And uh, I wrote that in a true democracy, ultimately, any political decision uh, is the responsibility of the electorate. But I didn't think that, and nor did the court, that that meant that every one of these shifts between local and state governments should require approval, pre, pre clearance from the uh, Attorney General. Because as you know, the Attorney General has to pre clear any change under the Voting Rights Act. Um, I, it's the cases, I think the rehearing petition maybe is not over, so I, I shouldn't get into it at great length. Um, but the opinion says uh, that we simply found no principled stopping point once you said that intergovernmental shifts, local versus state, state versus local, are covered by the Act. This happens thousands of times in every state jurisdiction. And if the, in a particular um, jurisdiction, the state legislature gives more power to a local entity, then that would require preclearance. And if it takes less power from the local entity, that would require preclearance. And we said we didn't think this was voting. And, and, and incidentally, let me just, and incidentally, uh, this is a good example of statutory construction. We don't condone what happened down there. We weren't born yesterday. We know that an unpopular person, unpopular by reason of their race, can be pushed around by their colleagues. But the question is whether or not this statute covered it. And if the statute is broken, Congress can fix it. If there's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, as there well might be, there might be a 1983 action. Uh, but this idea that the press would tell you about this, oh, this right-wing court does not stick up uh, for the system uh, and expand it to cure every injustice is, is just, in my view, wrong. I, I, my my commission is to interpret the statute, not to make it up. Now, let's get back to your question. <laughs> How much freedom do you have to change your mind about the Constitution, what you mean? Uh, I sometimes ask students, uh, and I used to ask them in my constitutional law class, case A and case B. Case A a decision of the Supreme Court interpreting a statute, and you think it might be wrong. Case B, a decision of the Supreme Court interpreting the Constitution of the United States, and you might, and you think it might be wrong. In which of the two cases does the doctrine of stare decisis weigh more heavily? And you can argue that. In my view, it weighs more heavily changes is is less indicated when it's a statutory issue because Congress can change it. If we're wrong about the Voting Rights Act, they can change it. 
uh, not with the Constitution. So I think we have a special obligation if we think that a decision is fundamentally and demonstrably wrong to examine it. Now, uh, remember, though, that stare decisis um, is, isn't just some kind of lever or rubber stamp you put stare decisis on. It, it's a description for a process. It's a very important process. It's one of the constraints that judges use to control themselves. Because if every judge is just a, uh, a free agent unbounded by precedent, you have no stability. You can have no justified expectations. And you have no control on the untrammeled will of the judge himself. So even in the Constitution area, uh, era, uh, arena, uh, stare decisis is a very, very powerful and a very, very important doctrine. Yes. Justice Kennedy, considering that it's just been five technical little prices, a little bit about that. Can you share your views as far as what was the original intent of the framers behind the 19th amendments and how they interact with the Constitution? The Ninth and, and Tenth Amendments are, are, are puzzles. They, they really basically talk about powers and duties. Uh, I think the Ninth and Tenth Amendment are something of a reserve clause in case things get really out of hand. I'm not willing uh, to say they have no content. Uh, on, on, on the other hand, it, it seems to me very strange that the framers would say that the Tenth Amendment, which reserves the power to the states or to the people, is an open-ended delegation uh, to the Supreme Court to overrule the laws of the states. I, I, that, that just seems to me fundamentally contradictory. Uh, now, as, as you know, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments have, have not been often invoked, and their text simply doesn't help me. I think the text is, is in effect, a tautology. I, I frankly don't see what you get from those provisions that you don't get from the words liberty in the f Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Yes. And am I right that, that no majority opinion of the court has ever relied on the Ninth Amendment? Justice Goldberg in the Griswold case cited it, but he did not have the majority. Yes. I think that original intent is stronger than precedent. And secondly, do you think original intent is a sufficient doctrine? Do, do I think original intent is stronger than precedent, and secondly, do I think original intent is a, a valid doctrine? You know, that wasn't your word. Your, uh, sustainable. Sustainable. Sustainable doctrine. Uh, in part, it depends on what you mean by original intent. Uh, if by original intent you mean, did the framers actually think about it? Well, of course they didn't. Uh, if you take it up one level and say, well, what would the framers had thought if they thought about it? Uh, that seems to me just entirely speculative. If, though, you take the position that the Constitution of the United States is a written covenant, one in which the framers elected to use a written instrument, which has all the intendments that you're usually in favor, that are usually in favor of construing an instrument. Uh, if they believed that they were setting forth certain principles that were binding on themselves and binding on the generations to follow. And if you believe that intent broadly understood shows that there's a purpose and a meaning to those phrases that the framers had from a historical standpoint, then uh, I think there is a great amount of substance to the doctrine of original intent.
I think the text of the Constitution gets us much further than many people think. I would have to disagree with my colleague Justice Scalia who says that that's all there is. Uh, if I could give a better answer to your question, I would have been Chief Justice five years ago, but I... <laughs> Yes. Let's go back to the road that you traveled. Excuse me, from from law school to where you are today. You look back down that road. Is there anything that you discovered along that path that you wish you'd known when you go back to school? (laughs) You mean by the law? (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a very nice question. Uh, as, as, as As I look back, on uh, the road that I've traveled from law school to the Supreme Court, uh, is there anything that you wish you could have looked back on, or that, that you would have done differently, or that you wish you had known that you didn't know now? I, you know, uh, I don't think I, I still understand the extent to which we are the prisoners of our own biases and our own generation. When I attended law school, out of a class of 500, we had five women. We had a professor who had a rule that he would not call on women. They were free to volunteer. And to make up for this, we had Ladies' Day, in which the ladies would conduct the classes. And there were songs and music, and we thought of it as a joke. And even my lady classmates did not really think of it as a fundamental affront to their own human personality. Uh, and I thought I'd, and then I taught law school and I could see the number of women increasing in every class. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm with it now. Uh, you know, I, I had this one little bias, but they're all over now. Now I'm completely free of biases and prejudices. Uh, but I'd wish I'd known at an early age the extent to which you're blind to human injustice. And I still try to teach myself that, but we're, we're creatures of time. And that's why the case system is so important. That's why it's so important for you to see to somebody who's really been injured and to see what the law can or should provide that recovery. And and just as I think I'm free to bias, I I run into something new. Now, no person, no judge, is a completely clean slate, freed of all constraints and compulsions by reason of their background and their upbringing and their personal philosophy. But I wish I knew as a younger person, I I wish I knew even better now the extent to which there are some neutral principles that I can't see. Yes, sir. Judge? This is kind of a purview of the atmosphere here, but problems all the problems we have have been workers all over the country. Many, many places. We have here in Illinois. Uh, we have many, many um, murder cases, capital cases, uh, mostly capital cases, which seem to go on for years and years. Uh, what's the trouble with disposing of those cases? Well, I, I think with uh, adjudication of capital sentences, and I was up till a quarter to five this morning with one that's in Texas. Um, I think you see the system at its best and it's at its worst. You see it at its best in that we want to 
ensure that every argument has been examined, that every fairness has been extended, that every right has been respected. You see it at its worst because it goes on and on and on. And there is no justice if the state cannot enforce its criminal sanctions. And the reality and the awfulness of the capital sentence is that it must be enforced in a prompt manner or the state's objectives are not being met. Now you can you can argue about the, the morality of the death penalty, and I think reasonable people can disagree about that. But the system seems to lack confidence in itself, and it seems to me we must not lack the will to enforce the law. I sometimes think, Judge, that the American people, as 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 a whole the extent we can generalize, want the death penalty on the books, but they don't want to enforce it very often. I think they like that inconsistency. Uh, on the criminal system, generally, I go into moods of resignation all the way to despondency. Uh, we now have close to 750,000 people incarcerated in, in the United States. And you can argue that this means that you, you can argue this two ways. One, you can say it's a law-abiding society. We enforce the law. And people, there are many people who will tell you there are not enough in, in, in prison because if, if you see statistics on how many burglaries or robberies there were, or dope sales. For every one person we caught, he's committed 20, 30, 40 of those, of those crimes. And under current philosophy, the pendulum swings between rehabilitation and, and incarceration as deterrence. Under current philosophy, the only thing we've come up with is preventative detention. This has serious consequences for our society, especially when you're going to find that young black males nationwide constitute uh, the biggest percentage of, of any group in any prison, state, or federal. You know, I simply don't have the answer to this. I suppose I'm, in a sense, in charge of the criminal system. But I can't pretend that being a strict judge or a liberal judge has a whole lot to do with human behavior. And I think we've just got to begin at every level with head start in education, family values. Uh, the death penalty, uh, if it really works, judge, maybe you have to use it in the state of California a hundred times a year. Are the people ready for that? I don't know. I have to tell you that this business of the last minute, fifth, sixth appeal uh, is, I think, a travesty of the system. We have the finest process for the adjudication of guilt or innocence that a system has ever devised. But you know what? The legal profession concentrates just on the system. So far as prevention, the legal profession does next to nothing. So far as correction and rehabilitation, next to nothing. We'll throw away the key and go on to the next case. The pediatricians are really the leaders in telling us what child abuse it is and how it can be diagnosed. And I don't think the legal profession as a whole does nearly enough to address the problem of crime in the criminal system across the board. Uh, 
long answer, Judge. Yes. Justice, in light of what you said concerning death penalty and the starting sites, could you comment, sir, on the recent opinion of the court, which had changed the law in respect to the victim being executed? Uh, with reference to my comments on stare decisis and the criminal law generally, could I comment on the recent case in which the law changed the rule on victims' impact testimony? Um, the case was Payne versus Tennessee. Um, when does stare decisis apply with more force? When a rule is two years old, well, that's, that, that one was just as positive. When a rule is, let's say, six years old, uh, or when it's 60 years old, when does uh, stare decisis apply with more force? When the rule came on the legal system with, without a great deal of writing and thought and scholarship, or when it did? Those are the concerns I have with the pain case. Um, I'm very troubled by victims' impact testimony. Uh, as a trial judge, um, I don't think I would have allowed a lot of the stuff that I've seen in, in these cases. Um, on the other hand, the victims' impact testimony is teaching us a lot about the system. I used to go to American Samoa all the time where I not all the time, and it's so too far away, but um, I used to sit on the territorial court down there. And uh, there's a private dispute resolution system down there in which the transgressor sits in front of the victim's home with gifts. And the victim is makes the transgressor wait for a little while, depending on the gravity of the offense. But then they go out and there's a reconciliation, a healing process. You see this in some victim's impact testimony. I, I've had trial judges tell me that they'll have probation officers, the judge himself talk to this defendant, but the defendant doesn't realize the gravity of the injury, the tragic suffering that the defendants caused until the survivors and their families come to the stand. And I, maybe this is an exaggerated, uh, an idealistic notion of, of what's going to happen most of the time. But I think the states in their separate capacity should feel free to experiment with it. I am, of course, concerned that emotional testimony um, can prejudice a jury. And uh, we don't have very many cases in the Supreme Court on that. And I've seen some cases that to me go right to the verge. And trial judges, I think, must be very, very careful about instructing the jury about the dangers and the utility of this testimony and, uh, and, and in confining the witnesses. Yes, way in the back of the room. Uh, I, excuse me, the lady who had her Hand up, and then and then I'll call on you. Yes. Uh, the Chief Justice uh, uh, assigns opinions. How do I feel that the tradition in the the, the move toward plain writing? Uh, affects traditional legalese. Well, I, I, I have a little trouble connecting the two questions because if the Chief Justice gave all the opinions to the best writer, then I'd have too much work. <laughs> um, I, I, I can tell when I, when I pick up an opinion who, who's written it. Um, uh, I, I don't know about writing style. It, it's tough. I, I think the word processor has made my writing style worse. Uh, if I get in real trouble, I have to go to a legal pad. Uh, I used to tell my students that sometimes 
we, we talk about writing with clarity and lucidity. Sometimes the art in the law is to write with ambiguity. And this includes contract negotiations. Uh, sometimes the parties simply cannot agree on some very basic issue, but they want a, to be bound nonetheless. And that's a real lawyer's art. And of course, we're not trying to hide the ball, but we write, there's a lot of choices you have. You can be very fact specific, in which case you don't do the legal system any good. You can give very general rules of guidance, in which case your chances of error are great, or you can do something in between. Uh, I, I think lawyers have always, and judges have always had a bad rap on their poor writing style. I, I think some lawyers are, are, are excellent. Um, read the brief and read the closing argument in um, the jury preemption case, Edmondson versus Leesville Concrete. I, I can't do justice to the argument, but in closing, the petitioner's counsel said, uh, some uh, men had been excused from the jury by reason of their race, they were black. So this case involves people who are not before the court. Their names, their ages, their occupation is unknown. And that's because they were never asked those very basic questions. They were excused from the jury by reason of their race, and they were hurt. It was a beautiful argument. He did it better than I did. Uh, but I, I think as a profession, we're generally pretty good writers. Um, and uh, you know, I, there's there's a lot of room for improvement in all of our stuff. You 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 don't have much time. I sometimes think the less time I spend on something, the better better it is. I, I wrote a concurrence in the, what was in the flag case that I, I just wrote out in about a half an hour at night. And it seems to work fine. I didn't cite any case. I always wanted to be in the Supreme Court because I said I'm not going to cite all these cases. I'm in the Supreme Court. Why do I have to cite any cases? <laughs> uh, but I, I haven't kept to that. Now, now there was a gentleman that I pre-admitted. Yes. Yes. Uh, in my experience and observation with the law, uh, people have discussed what makes a good judge. Uh, and it's not always about the size of the bench. It's about the size of the bench. Uh, and that goes to someone who uh, is one-sided on a certain issue with the press labels. So the Supreme Court's conservative or liberal. What steps can the judiciary take to discourage complacency among judges and to let them know that they really are judges and not stand for one policy? What, what steps can the judiciary take to ensure that judges recognize that they are not just a surrogate for a particular point of view, uh, that they must remain open-minded? Uh, I'm not a guru on, on judicial selection. Uh, I think that the federal system has been tremendously fortunate uh, in the kind of judges that we've been able to recruit to serve. I was very concerned uh, in the last five to ten years uh, that we would not get really fine people to be on the federal bench. When I was growing up in Sacramento, the two finest attorneys in town, with the exception of my dad, were on the bench, on the federal bench. And they went on at the age 45 or 50 to cap off a great career. With problems of security, I mean personal security, um, income, although that's been partially mitigated, uh, financial disclosure, publicity, um, the isolation that it imposes on you in your own community, in your own society. It's, I was concerned that it's difficult to get people to serve on the federal bench. But I've had the pleasure of uh, lecturing at what we call the Baby Judges School. It's the Federal Judicial Center's introductory three-week course for new judges. 
new district judges from around the United States. And I am so inspired by the idealism and the quality and the commitment of these people. I, I can't complain about young judges because it's, I was one, still am maybe. Um, I, but I, I do think administrations have to be careful about appointing judges at a very young age. I think you should not appoint a judge until the judge knows who he or she is. Uh, and if you appoint a person too young, I'm not sure they know that. And now, of course, there are exceptions and there should be balance and we should have youth and vitality and so forth. But this idea that we have to appoint circuit judges uh, who are in their mid-30s, uh, I, I, I think is dangerous. Although at the district court level, the results have been just marvelous and, and, and at the circuit court too, so far as that's concerned. We've been very fortunate in the federal system. And one, one reason is this screening process, this amorphous, unwieldy, awkward, half political, half principled, half legally principled process seems to work. But judges must always be on their guard. And uh, the thing I dislike most about what I do now is that I don't have a judge on some other court to tell me that I'm wrong. Although I have a lot of judges on my own court that do that. <laughs> yes. How long does this go on? Don't these people have anything to do, Dean? Or... <laughs> uh, let, let, let me just say, what, what, what do you want to do here? Uh, well, I mean, how long? How long do you want to go? Uh, one, two questions. One question. The lady. The, the lady that was behind the gentleman. Yes. Um, I just want to focus your attention on peremptory challenges and a potential discriminatory use of peremptory challenges and a potential discriminatory use of peremptory selection. Yes. Two questions. First, is Adam Kelly Powell the first Obama Supreme Court justice to be appointed to the Supreme Court? And second, is there any evidence that Adam Powell was the first Obama Supreme Court justice to be appointed to the Supreme Court? Secondly, the question is how far since that uh, good questions that we had to argue about in the opinion, and those opinions uh, leave all those questions open, and I, I really shouldn't commit myself, uh, I, I, I think. Uh, and part of the reason is I don't know the answer. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I just wanted to say um, that uh, when I'm here in your law school, um, that, that I hope you find law school in some respects, not all the time, an enriching process. Um, you know, in England, where they're so proud of their legal system, they, they don't have what we do. No, no country in the world does. And in part, we have it by design, in part by accident, in part by providence. But, but we have a system in which we have, as a condition of licensure, passing the bar, as a condition of graduation, getting your degree from here, the fact that you must know and master the entire extant legal tradition up to that point. The judge learned Mulberry versus Madison and McCulloch versus Maryland, and you had to learn the same thing. But you also have to learn Powers versus Ohio and Edmondson and Leesville Concrete. And the latest thing we say, and this is a formal tradition for transmitting our legal culture from one generation to the next, and I assure you, it is the envy of the world. You may think that you are overburdened, that you're busy, uh, that your professors are sometimes unfair. Maybe they are sometimes. Uh, believe me, you will not have the opportunity to reflect and to know and to understand the law and your own humanity 
with the degree of latitude that you do now once you leave this institution. I always used to tell my students, I, I was known, I think, as, as a very rigorous professor. And if the student hadn't read the case, I'd say, well, perfect. The judge hadn't read it when he wrote it either. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, then I'd stay with that student and uh, try to show the student uh, that there is a formal structure of legal reasoning. Sometimes uh, people say, oh, he's just teach law students how to think. Well, any school does that. I mean, that's a presumptuous statement. Uh, we do teach you to think about very ordinary things in a very formal way. And part of the Socratic dynamic, which I used to use for the first hour and 20 minutes until everybody was reached their wit's end, uh, is that you allow the student to use skills of logic and graciousness and ethics and politeness and persuasion. And this is a classroom dynamic that's tremendously important. And I hope you appreciate why you're here, the, the rich resources of this law school. And I'm, I'm just delighted to visit with you and I hope I can come back soon. Thank you. Mr. Justice, obviously you hate to stop that standing ovation, which is so richly deserved, and so many of the students who are uh, resisted going back to class in order to stay here. We want to thank you. I speak for everyone here, I'm sure, when I say that. One of the things I neglected to say is that the Justice served for nine years on the Advisory Committee on Judicial Ethics of the Judicial Conference. Uh, we didn't allow him to stand and talk there. <laughs> We did allow him to stand and talk for an hour and 20 minutes here today, for which we're very grateful. We really got, and certainly I did, a lesson in the Constitution and in the law and in the court, and we didn't pay a penny's tuition. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>